He is risen. risen Welcome to all. Great to see you today. We are beginning a series on the topic of anxiety. So it's something we probably all deal with a little bit. And I have some very interesting and important things to share with you on the topic. So I'm so glad that you're here to find out more. Let's go right into our pre-service confession and absolution at this time. As we begin these words, keep in mind that though our sins are great, God is so much greater. That's what we think about with this very first phrase. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Though we have sinned, there is great news from our great God. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
At this time, would you please arise and face our entrance? We are gathered as the children of God to receive the gifts of God. And how did we become his children when he was at work through baptism to clothe us in Christ and make us his very own? We remember that reality here in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, O Christ, O Lord, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, cause us to remember your total control, unwavering faithfulness, and great mercy so that we trust in you, have peace in you, and rejoice in you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. I invite the children to please come forward. Good morning. Okay, you're, you're here, you're awake. I'm so glad to, of that. Well, today we are thinking about some of the great goodness 
that God shows to us. So you guys know when something is bad, so the opposite would be something that is good, and God showers like all this good on us. You know how when it rains, we all get wet. Well, when God sends his goodness down, we have all this goodness. What do I mean by that? Well, think about us right now in our bodies. We are alive. That is a blessing from God. God has given us life. You know, we are alive in a second way. Did you guys know we're alive in two ways? So God has, God has made us spiritually alive, and God did that when we were baptized. So it's important to be alive in two ways, and God has done it. I have a whole list of ways in which God is good to us. So God has given us families. So we have father, mother, sometimes we have a brother or a sister. So a family, that is a blessing from God. Wow. And then we have food to eat. We have clothes to wear. Where do our clothes come from? You are right, Noah. So some people might say, oh, they came from mommy, they came from daddy, they came from a store, and that would be true. But ultimately, though, God is the one who gave us our clothes. God is the one who gives us what we eat. When you guys go to sleep, do you sleep on the floor? No. What do you sleep in? Where did your bed come from? From God. God is so, so good to us. I have more things on the list too. You can go over that with your parents when you get home today, but let's pay attention. Let's look around. Let's see all these blessings that God has given to us and let us say, what should we say to God? He's, when he gives us wonderful things, what should we say back to him? Thank you, Thank you sure. So God is a great, great God. Okay, guys, thanks for coming up. You can take a bag here and head back to your seats. You're welcome. You might have noticed in the folder today, I'm combining the sermon and the scripture readings. We have a lot of scripture in today's sermon, and you can see that they're listed out in today's service folder. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, whether we admit it or not, let's realize there are a lot of forces in the world that are trying to make us anxious about a lot of things. And I think probably a lot of people within our nation and even around the world, they are very anxious about so many things. Does God want us to be that way? By no means. The Bible says that we should be anxious for nothing. Here we are, Bible-believing Christians. Are we all anxious for nothing? Are we not anxious at all? 
That's probably not true for us, but I think it's not true because there are some fundamental things that we either do not know or we are not making application in our lives. We're going to find out some of those today, and I'm hoping that what I share is a great blessing to all of us. I want to continue here by talking about the difference between fear and anxiety. Some people might use those words interchangeably, but let's understand there is a fundamental difference. Fear sees a threat. Anxiety imagines a threat. Let's say that you're taking a little trip, you're in the Smoky Mountains, you're walking through the woods, and you realize that a bear is following you. You see the bear. That would be fear. Anxiety would be that you're walking through the woods, you don't see any bears at all, but you're imagining that there might be a bear behind every tree. Can you see the difference? Let me share something with you in a little more tangible way as we go on to today's gospel reading. I'm gonna read part of it now from Mark chapter four. The Bible says, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. That would be the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Leaving the crowd, the disciples took Jesus along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce, gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. What was going on with those disciples? They had fear. They could feel the wind. They could see the waves. The waves were already inside the boat. That was fear. What would be anxiety? That would be if Jesus said, hey guys, let's go over to the other side and they're imagining there could be a storm. And they're like, oh, we don't wanna go, Jesus. We're afraid there might be a storm when we try to cross the Sea of Galilee. Can you see the difference then between fear and anxiety? Does Jesus want us to live with fear and worry and anxiety? By no means. He said this in Luke 21, be on your guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with the worries of life. Are there things in life that we could be worried about? By all means, but Jesus is saying, don't dwell on such things, don't let those things weigh you down. It is not necessary at all. And I'm gonna to come to why it's not necessary as we continue through this sermon. Let's admit, life certainly has problems. We probably all have at least one problem in our lives right now, probably a whole lot more than one, but what is the good news though? The almighty God, he has a solution to every single one of our problems. Let's keep that in mind. As I think about this series on the topic of anxiety, there is one key passage in the Bible. I wanna read it to you now, and I'm gonna to touch on it in some detail a little bit in today's sermon. I'm gonna get into it in future sermons as well. But let's do an overview of it now. It's a passage that we're probably all very familiar with, but I think there are things in it that we have probably never considered before. And let me even admit this. I learned something in the last week where the majority of this passage, I memorized it probably 30 years ago, and yet having known it all those years, and having reviewed it on a regular basis over all that time, and there was a really fundamental thing, a super important thing that I missed over all that time. So I'm excited to share that with you and more as well. But here's the passage though, Philippians chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, 
If there is any excellence or anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. That's the passage, that's the key passage. We're gonna find out a whole bunch of treasures from that passage, some today and some in the weeks ahead. Let me mention a couple key things here. The passage is really telling us to celebrate God's goodness. How, do, how are we supposed to do that? According to the passage, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Is that possible? In fact, it is when we have the right information. This passage is telling us to ask for help from God. How do we do that? The passage says, let your requests be made known to God. Let's make that a first resort rather than a last resort. It tells us here that we are to leave our concerns with God. What does the passage say? It says we are to do that by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And of course, all of those things will get our requests to God. And then we have to be so careful that when we stop praying that we don't grab them all back. So common for us to do, but we take them to God and then we leave them with God so important and then it tells us to meditate on good things when we fill our mind with good things when we fill our mind with the things of God then there's not much room for the bad things there's not much room to be anxious did you notice a list there all kinds of amazing things whatever is honorable whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is of good repute if there is any excellence or anything worthy of praise let your mind dwell on these things we have so much negativity that's trying to get in there so we have to step it up and we have to be diligent about putting the good in there so there is no room for the bad. We're gonna learn more about that as we go. I wanna go on to the topic here of the Lord's sovereignty. Not something we talk about a lot, but I wanna share with you a key passage here. We have St. Paul writing to Timothy, the young pastor, and he writes to him, God, who is the blessed and only sovereign, will bring about the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ at the proper time. So he's simply saying that God the Father has it all figured out. God has all power. God has control over all things. And our Lord Jesus Christ will come back according to God's plan, according to God's power, according to God's control. Did you notice what it said there? It said that God is the only sovereign. So it's not like God has a bunch of control over here and there are other forces with a bunch of control and they're competing. No, God is the only sovereign. God has almighty power. God is truly in control of all things. And keep in mind, even when things seem out of control, so I said when things seem out of control, God is still in control control. So important for us to keep that in mind because we tend to get drawn in to what we are seeing and we forget about the reality of what's going on with the Almighty God. In Proverbs chapter 21 it says, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Why is that true? Because he is sovereign, because he is almighty, because he is in control of all things. Again, we need to keep those things in mind. I wanna share with you a study they did in connection with World War II. And they found that the ground troops were a lot more anxious than the fighter pilots. But that doesn't make any sense, so if you think about it, because even though it was very dangerous for the ground troops, they were always enduring the threat of being bombed, of being hit by machine gun fire, of enemy snipers. They were always under that threat, but yet the fighter pilots, there was a much greater risk of dying if you were a fighter pilot. 
So why is it that the ones who had less of a chance of dying had greater anxiety than the ones that had a greater chance of dying? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Oh, well, here's the reason why. The reason is because anxiety increases as perceived control diminishes. When you think about the ground troops, just standing there, they could be killed. Running away from the enemy, they could be killed. In other words, they had very little control over what was going on, but the fighter pilots, they had their hands on the control of the plane, and because they perceived that they had control over what they were doing, they liked their work a lot more than the ground troops, and they felt a lot more at ease because they felt this sense of control. What about us then? Is the answer that we just control everything and we'll have no anxiety? Has anyone ever tried to do that? We probably all have at times, but that won't work either. So what is the answer? Let us remember God is sovereign, God is in control, so we trust him. That is the answer. We can't control things, so we trust the one who is in complete control. Let me go back to the gospel reading here for a moment, picking up in Mark chapter four. The Bible says, the disciples said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. The disciples could do nothing. Here they are in the boat. The boat is filling with water. Things seem to be out of control. And yet, if they would have simply been trusting in the Son of God, who was right in the boat with them, they didn't have to fear anything. God was in complete control, and when they finally asked for help, everything was okay. God wants us to learn from that, benefit from that. Think about what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter one. He talked about being in prison in Rome and if you think about the difficulty he had in getting to Rome with the shipwreck and all the other things that happened as recorded in the book of Acts, and then he gets to Rome and then he's in prison, notice what he wrote. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known. So Paul, even though it was super difficult for him, Paul realized that God is sovereign. God is in control. Even though I don't understand what's going on, I don't like what's going on, it's difficult what's going on, but I know that God is in control. I know God has a plan. And Paul could see how God was working through him in order to get the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ to many, many other people. So Paul was willing to go along with whatever. I want to share with you a story about a 10-year-old boy who didn't understand about the, ability, about the abilities of his father, who was an orthopedic surgeon. So the situation here is that this 10-year-old boy, he ended up spraining his ankle pretty bad, and it was just weeks before his first school dance, and he was excited about going. Now he has a sprained ankle, now he can't even walk, now he's on crutches, and he goes to his father and he says, do you think I'll be okay? And his father said, son, you'll be fine. But the problem is, because this 10-year-old boy really did not know what his father did, he did not accept what his father said, and he was anxious about the whole thing. So here's what happened. I want to share this story with you. I'm going to pick up part way through. And the father goes to the son and he says to him, son, it's time to learn more about who I am and what I do. So it goes like this. The next day he is waiting for his son in the school parking lot after classes. He says to him, hop in, I want you to see what I do. 
They drive to his hospital office, and he shows his son this constellation of all these diplomas on his wall. The son is looking it over, and he notices the words distinguished and honorable. And then his father hands him this manual of orthopedic surgery, and the son notices that his father's name is on the book. And he says to him, Dad, you didn't write this book, did you? And he said, yes, I did. And then the father's cell phone rings, and it's information saying, Doctor, it's time to come into the operating room. So he tells his son, let's both scrub up. We're going to both go into the operating room, and you can see what I do. So they go in there. The son's going in on his crutches. Remember, he has a badly sprained ankle. And during the next few minutes, he gets to see his father reconstruct, reconstruct an ankle. As the story goes, the father is in complete control in the operating room. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't seek advice from anyone. He just does the work that he knows very well how to do. One of the nurses whispers to the son and says, your dad is the best. As they're riding home that evening, the son looks at the father and he looks at him in a completely different light realizing that if he could do that on an ankle certainly he would have a very good opinion on a sprained ankle so he says to his dad again dad do you think I'll be okay the father said yes you're definitely going to be okay and this time the son believed him why did he believe him? Because now he understands the abilities of his father. What is our problem? Our problem is that we don't think oftentimes about the abilities of our father. We have the greatest father of all. We have God as our father. He has all abilities, and yet we can become anxious because either we don't know such things or we're not thinking about such things. They are so critical in this whole process. Let's understand that our anxiety will decrease as we better understand the abilities of God. Our Father. Let me go on here as we think about the Lord's mercy. I want to talk a little bit in this section about our sin and our guilt and how we deal with it. Oftentimes not in the best ways. What can guilt do? Guilt can make us anxious. That's one thing that can happen. So what do we do oftentimes? We are pretty good at dealing with guilt in wrong ways. Sometimes when we're feeling guilty, we try to numb the guilt. How can we do that? Maybe by drinking too much of an alcoholic beverage that can numb the guilt. Or we can deny the guilt. We can so thoroughly cover it up that I can't see it, you can't see it, and it seems to be gone. Or we can bury the guilt. Maybe from the moment we wake up until the moment we go to bed, we are so busy with our regular work, with home projects, whatever it might be, we are so busy that we don't even have time to think about it. So we try all these different ways to get rid of it. Is that what King David tried to do when he fell into great sin? He did. He tried all kinds of ways to get rid of it, and it wasn't working for him. David prayed in Psalm 32, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. So he had the sin, he kept it inside. It was like it was eating him up inside. He tried to do it, it just wasn't working. And then God opened his eyes to understand that our Father in heaven, he is a God of great love, a God of great mercy. We can, we can lay it all out there for him, and he will show mercy upon us. He will love us. He will forgive us. So it goes on, and David prayed again, I acknowledge my sin to you, my Father in heaven, and my iniquity I did not hide and you forgave the guilt of my sin. 
So important that we don't try to hide it. That's not going to work out. Put it out there for God and let us know that God will forgive it. We can with confidence put it out there, confident that God will forgive it. So when we think about having sin in our lives, should we be focusing on the sin that is over and done with and forgiven? Or should we be looking ahead in our lives, going forward in our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, sometimes people are living here, but God doesn't want that for us. He wants us to go here. St. Paul had the same situation. Think about his sins. St. Paul had orders from the government. He's traveling around from city to city. He's finding the Christians. He's arresting them. He's bringing them back to Jerusalem. They're being put in prison. For what purpose? To be put to death. He could have been overwhelmed by his sins, but yet Paul wrote this. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When we think about driving our cars, think about how you're sitting in the driver's seat, and when you look forward, you have a big windshield that you can see out of. And then for most cars, right up about here, you have a little rear view mirror. So you can see what's behind you, but the mirror is so small in comparison to the front windshield. What should that remind us of every time we are in the car? It should remind us that our future matters a whole lot more than our past. Our past is the rear view mirror. Our future is the windshield. Let's remember that. Let's thank God that for any sin in the past, we are forgiven. Our future is in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we can go forward with peace and with joy unto the glory of our Father in heaven. Does anybody know the secret of a trapeze artist? There's a secret of having um, to go through that particular profession. And if you don't know the secret, it's not going to work out well. Who has been a trapeze artist in the past? Do we have any here? Okay. Well, I want to share with you a story here about a man who is a trapeze artist, and he's going to tell us the secret of how to be one. And maybe if we want to become one in the future, we would know the secret already. So it could be helpful. So this is what the man said. He said, the secret is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. The flyer does nothing, the catcher does everything. What does that mean? He's going to tell us. When I fly to Joe, who is my catcher, he said, I simply have to stretch my arms and hands and wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron. And then he went on to say, the worst thing the flyer can do is to try to catch the catcher. So like from our perspective, we might think both people are the same, but keep in mind, you have a flyer and a catcher. So the worst thing the flyer can do is to try to catch the catcher. He said, I'm not supposed to catch Joe. It's Joe's task to catch me. I'm the flyer. And then he said, if I grabbed Joe's wrists, I might break them or he might break mine, and that would be the end for both of us. A flyer must fly, and a catcher must catch, and the flyer must, must trust. The flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. So much easier said than done, but so, so important. When we think about God being the catcher in regard to salvation, can we do something? Can we grab onto God? We don't even have that ability. The Bible is clear that before God makes us alive in Christ, we are spiritually blind, we are spiritually dead, we are spiritual enemies of God. The Bible is so clear on that. So God is simply saying, 
trust me, and that's it. That's all we can do is trust him when it comes to salvation. And what about for all the rest of life? Are we like, okay, God, I trusted you for salvation. Now I've got the rest on my own. No, that's not going to work either. God is saying, remember, I am sovereign. I am in control. I am almighty. I love you. So just trust me no matter what, and it's going to be okay. Again, easier said than done, but God wants us to know that these things are best. Let me conclude in this way today. A couple key passages here. Colossians chapter 1, it says, God the Son is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Some of you might remember how we talked years ago here about the cell adhesion molecule called laminin. Laminin, it's an interesting molecule. It's microscopic, but it's in the shape of a cross. And biologically, the, that cell adhesion molecule is holding together the trillions of cells within every one of our bodies. Isn't it interesting that it's in the shape of a cross? And then like it says here, God the Son is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Sometimes we think, oh, I've got this. I'm holding everything together. It's all working out because of me. Well, no, not at all. God wants us to know that this is the work of the Son of God. Let us know that. Let us rejoice in that. Let us trust in him for all things. And then in Ephesians chapter 1, God the Father works all things after the counsel of his will. Let me share with you two more things here before I conclude today. So think about the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. You know, Joseph went through so much. He was brother number 11 of 12 brothers, and he said some things that were true, but yet his older brothers did not like it at all, and they decided we're going to murder our brother. They hated him that much. They ended up selling him into slavery. He was taken to Egypt. He went through great misery in Egypt for years. But finally, though, God elevated him to a position in Egypt that we might call the position of prime minister. Really, he was second in line to Pharaoh over all of Egypt. And keep in mind, Egypt was the greatest nation in the world at that time. So he's kind of like the vice president of the greatest nation in the world. And then God used him not only to save the lives of his own brothers who were going to murder him, but his father and his sister and many, many other people as well. Now, when Joseph was in the midst of those great difficulties, he was probably wondering, dear God, where are you? What's going on? Why is this all going on? I don't understand. But yet, God was at work. Like I said, God works all things after the counsel of his will. So even when it seems out of control, it is so important to trust in God. What ended up happening? Finally, Jacob, their father, died, and the brothers come to Joseph, and they're thinking, because of what we tried to do to him, now that our father has died, he is going to put us to death. What did Joseph say? The famous words, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to, pre in order to preserve many people alive. Now, Joseph could finally see that at the end of all of this. Could he see it in the midst of it? I don't know, probably not. But it's important, though, for us to remember things like this. And even when we can't see it, know that God is in control and trust him anyway. Trust him no matter what. Thinking about our salvation. Think about our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about how horrible it was from later on Holy Thursday through Good Friday and how our Lord was so horribly treated how he was so severely beaten, how he was nailed to a cross, all that he went through. That would seem that things were completely out of control, that evil had risen up, that evil was over God, that evil was in control. 
That's what it seemed like, and yet it was all according to God's plan. The Bible says here, this is part of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. He said to the people, Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death, but God raised him up again. Can you see how much God loves us in that God would plan such a horrible horrible thing for his own son. Why did God plan it? He planned it because he loves us so much. He so much wants us to have our sins taken away. He so much wants us to be with him forever that he planned it out in order to win our salvation. Things were not out of control. God was in control every moment, every step of the way, and it was all for us. It was all for our salvation. Coming to the end today, let's remember a truth. So fear sees a threat. Anxiety imagines one. We imagine so many things that never come to pass. Let's stop imagining. Let us trust in God. Let us live with faith. Let us live with courage. Let us not be afraid. What's relevant for today? Hey, God is almighty. God is in control. It might not seem that way sometimes, but yet it is always, always true. God is always almighty. God is always in control. And then something inspirational. I want to read, with you, uh, read to you one final story here, and it's about the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. So you know the hymn. Maybe you know the story behind it, but let me share it with you here briefly. It was written by a man named Horatio Spafford. He was a prosperous lawyer and a Presbyterian church elder. In November of 1873, so about 150 years ago, Anna and their children, their four children, their four daughters, set sail for Europe with a group of friends. Horatio stayed home to take care of some business. On December 2nd, he received a telegram from his wife that began, saved alone, what shall I do? He soon learned that the ship that she was on, along with their daughters, had collided with a British vessel and had sunk. Their four daughters drowned and Anna, his wife, survived. He left for England to bring Anna back home in route on the ship, what did he do? He wrote this hymn, and this hymn is talking about the providence. This hymn is talking about the sovereignty of God. So he wrote the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, as he crossed the Atlantic to pick up his wife and be able to see the bodies of his four daughters who had died. It's a horrible thing but see, the point is, though, even though it seemed horrible and out of control, God is in control. God is almighty. We can trust him even in the midst of very difficult circumstances. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, you are our very best father. As we live this life, help us to fly like a trapeze artist, help us to fly and help us to do so in peace, always trusting that you will be there to catch us, always remembering that you are in control, that you love us, and in Christ our sins are forgiven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It's amazing to me he could write such a hymn on that journey, but quite a man of, of faith, of trust in God. 